Uh, our last section, I think this is probably my favorite um, because I, I think of what it means personally for me. Um, but we'll start with a statement from uh, Medical Ministry, page 256, and this is from paragraph 5. The spirit of persecution will not be excited against those who have no connection with God and so have no moral strength. It will be aroused against the faithful ones who make no concessions to the world and will not be swayed by its opinions, its favor, or its opposition. A religion that bears a living testimony in favor of holiness and that rebukes pride, selfishness, avarice, and fashionable sins will be hated by the world and by superficial Christians. When you suffer reproach and persecution, you are an excellent company, for Jesus endured it all and much more. If you are faithful sentinels for God, these things are a compliment to you. It is the heroic souls who will be true if they stand alone, who will win the imperishable crown. Uh, this last section is entitled, The Last Protestant, and hopefully after I've stopped talking, you'll process this last section because um, this was the whole point of these presentations. Um, who are we to be individually um, in terms of being on the side of God? Our scripture comes from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, and he said... I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, if you are familiar with this story, this is Elijah after he's received a death threat from Jezebel. Now, you can sort of extrapolate from that, from history to present day, to future. Um, he's being persecuted by a woman. You could think of it as a church, but it was the, the literal Jezebel. Um, and this prophet fit, fled for his life. And he's, he's really complaining to God, saying, I'm the only one left. What, what did God tell him? I have 7,000, right? So part of what this really, this last section is more about encouragement and hope uh, because we will stand alone. Um, and, and just to know that even though by physical appearances, it looks like you're by yourself, you know that you have angels that excel in strength that help you and will help you. Okay, this comes from a book called The Two Republics, uh, page 17. And it says, of all forms of government, the stability of the Republican depends most upon the integrity of the individual. Now, I'm going to sort of explain this as I see it from a prophetic, social sort of viewpoint. Our Republic, American, the American or United States, we are a Republic. Um, and, and unfortunately, we are a mirror image of the Roman Republic. Prophecy says that America, now I know people go, I can't find America in prophecy. The Bible speaks in terms of history. If you look in history, there's really only one nation that fits the first beast of Revelation 13. When I say nation, one entity. And there's only one that fits the identity of the second beast rising up out of the earth. Now, I know the majority of you know that. Um, but for those of you that don't, oftentimes, like if you look back in Daniel, the fourth beast isn't mentioned by name. But when you look in history, every historian will tell you it was the Roman Empire. So you won't, you won't read the Bible and go, up oh, the United States of America, you won't read that. Just like you did not read in Daniel that it was the Roman Empire that would be this, the beast with iron teeth. You have to look in history. Um, so what I want to say about this is um, Rome has a specific aim, and I said this earlier, to destroy individualism. And what you do in a republic that's successful, and you know Protestantism is the reason why we are 
affluent, while we are wealthy, when I say wealthy, I mean in terms of some of the social things that we have. I mean, God has blessed this country. But when you take away the rights of the individual, and if you, if you could think back in recent history with Supreme Court decisions on same-sex marriage, it didn't matter what the individual thought. It was what the public wanted. That's Roman thinking. It's consensus building. God is looking for us to, to stand, even if we have to stand alone. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple people who actually did that. Not, I mean, they're dead, but I mean, in history, that did that. So let's start with titles. Now, the title of it is The Last Protestant. And I'll explain to you later on what that means. It doesn't mean that there's going to be one left in the world. It's an application to the individual, but we'll get to that. Okay, so let's start with some definitions. This is from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Um, there's about four definitions here. This first one is protest. Um, I'm going to look at actually um, the second one, which says to make a solemn declaration expressive of opposition to protest. Now, uh, a Protestant, then, in the same dictionary, is pertaining to those who, and this is the historical definition, those who at the reformation of religion protested against the decree of Charles V and the deed of Spires pertaining to the adherence of Luther or others of the reformed churches as the Protestant religion. In history, I'm sure most of you know this if you've read The Great Controversy or any books on you know, the German Reformation, you understand that there was a king who wanted unity in his particular empire and individualism was out of the question. Um, and you know the whole thing was, oh, we're, we're being attacked by the Turks and we need to unify because there's an external threat. You think that's not going to happen again? Um, well, you may not, but it will, because it will be some external threat, whether it's climate change. I did that on purpose because I know it's not real. Um, I recognize that HARP exists in the world and all those other things, but um, calamities will be created to move the masses into position to accept false doctrine, false teaching. Um, so that is a Protestant. Um, basically, you're in opposition to something that's not biblical. And Protestantism is obviously the Protestant religion. Now, two things about Protestantism. Now, A.T. Jones, in his book, Lessons from the Reformation, this is on page uh, 15, there are two aspects to Protestantism. Now, the first is the right of private judgment in religion. No man can tell you what to think, what to believe, how to worship. And you know from prophecy that that is going to happen. You will be forced to worship a certain way. Um, the second aspect of Protestantism is the principle of individual responsibility to God. That, I think, is probably more important than the first one. Because no man can tell you who God is for you, uh, how you should worship. But as Christians, we have a, a blueprint for who God is. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. Who He is, what He expects from His people. Now, the first person, my favorite reformer that I want to talk about... Um, in terms of people who had to stand against the opposition, I want to say relatively to the world, opposition to the world, was Martin Luther. And this, this statement here actually comes from, um, it'll come to me in a minute. Uh, but this is uh, page 375. It says, So long as Protestants held faithfully to the gospel alone and depended only upon its power, the papacy which then possessed all the power of Europe was powerless before them. Martin Luther, the chief and leader of the opposition to the papacy in that day, was attacked with all the power, cunning, and craft of the papacy. By the published decree of the emperor in behalf of Holy Church, he was outlawed in all Europe. 
and everybody was commanded under penalty of treason to take him and deliver him up and receive the reward due to so good a work. Yet for all this, the papacy was unable ever to lay a hand on him or to do him harm. And he died at last peaceably and in his bed, an everlasting victor over all the power of the papacy. And living and dying, a proof to all the world of what a man can do in opposition to the papacy, who depends upon the gospel alone and is allied to the power of God only. Um, the title of that publication is called Present Truth. You'll see PTUK, but it's actually Present Truth from the UK, United Kingdom. That's page 375. This was June 14, 1894. Now, as you look in Europe, and we're going sort of back in history uh, to the Reformation, uh, Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Jerome of Bohemia, they all had one thing in common. And this is a statement from the Great Controversy, page 167, and it says, Opposition is the lot of all whom God employs to present truths especially applicable to their time. Do we have that? We call it the three angels' messages. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Do not worship the beast and his image. Um, and so for each of these men, and I want to point that out. Uh, if you're on the Lord's side, you should expect trouble. And even with that, you should probably hope in the fact that God will shield you from that. Um, I mean, and, and what do we have to go through? What is it called? Trial. Uh, and uh, I think in the Old Testament, God is, is um, depicted as a refiner of silver sitting by a fire. Um, I'm not sure exactly where this statue is, but this is another statement from Martin Luther, statue of Martin Luther. But it says here, in the presence of a crowd of students, doctors, and citizens of all ranks, Luther burned the Pope's bull with the canon laws, the decretals, and certain writings sustaining the papal power. My enemies have been able, by burning my books, he said, to injure the cause of truth in the minds of some and to destroy souls. For this reason, I consume their books in return. A serious struggle has just commenced. Hitherto, I have been playing with the Pope. Now I wage open war. I began this work in God's name. It will be ended without me and by his might. Now, who do you think is supposed to finish that work? The remnant at the very end of time. Um, the second figure is Daniel. Now, early in the morning, this comes again from Present Truth. Um, this is actually July 16, 1903, page 459. Early in the morning, the king came to the den and called to Daniel to find out if he was still alive. How glad he was when Daniel answered and told him why the lions had not been able to eat him. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths. No one who loves and serves God has to stand alone, for the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Now, we should not be surprised because what did Christ say? This is your next scripture from Matthew chapter 10 verses 22 to 27. Christ said, and ye shall be hated of how many men? Now we're talking about wicked men. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. But verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. So if Jesus suffered persecution, how can we be expected to be jettisoned out of here with a secret rapture, without persecution? Because his own words are, the disciple is not above his master. Christ was beaten and crucified. Not saying that that would happen to us, but we are going to be persecuted for the cause of God. Now he continues saying, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? 
Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that ye speak in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that ye preach upon the housetops. What is Christ saying there? Now, oftentimes the Pharisees, now Pharisees are called what? Church folk. Oftentimes the Pharisees, oh, he has a devil. You can't believe him. So, are we going to be any different? The work that we're doing for God is trying to establish the truths in the Bible. That will be called the work of Satan. Um, and the other thing he's saying here, um, that which is, there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed. Well, for those of us that are among the timid, and I know that that means something else. For those of us that are among the timid, you won't stay that way for long. Because if you don't want to be discovered and you're a Christian, that won't happen. Because you will be revealed to the world because everybody will have to make an individual stand. And I know that what Christ is saying there is generally speaking, um, don't worry. I mean, and God can even tell you the secrets of men's hearts. You guys remember, and I'm trying to remember uh, what the name of the prophet was in the Old Testament. Um, well, the story kind of goes like this. Um, the t two kings in Israel wanted to go out to battle, and, and um, one king, oh, I think it was Jehoshaphat, he's like, let me call prophet so-and-so, and the king was like, ah, oh, he never prophesies anything good about me. You know, and so I'm saying that to say, uh, in, 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 in another story, there was, um, I'm trying, I don't know if this was Elijah or no, it was Elisha, um, where... Elisha would give directions to the armies of Israel for what the king of Assyria was doing and it disgusted in his tent. So, and I'm not saying God would do that for us, but I'm saying he would reveal men's hearts. Um, he doesn't want us to be in mortal danger. I mean, I'm not saying we're going to escape that, but how should we be? This is from uh, Signs of the Times, July 25th, 1900. They were not to be intimidated or terrified by opposition. By searching the scriptures and gaining a clear understanding of the reasons of their faith, they were to prepare for the time when they should be called upon to stand before kings and rulers. They were to regard themselves as under the special care and guardianship of God. They were not to be discouraged or cast down by persecution, but were to show themselves worthy of the sacred trust which had been given them. They would never be alone, for the Savior assured them that one more mighty than all their enemies would be constantly by their side. It is not ye that speak, Christ declared, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Quick question. Um, how, how powerful do you think the Holy Spirit is? Now, He's God, right? And uh, I read a statement that says, there is only one power in this world that can check the power of Satan. And it's the Holy Spirit. I'm saying that to say, when you have God on your side, I mean, what does the Bible say? Paul says it in Romans. What can man do to me? I'm not going to be afraid of that. But again, our mind has to be fixed on Christ. Now, the Church of Philadelphia, I, I thought I'd put this in so that we see what are some of their attributes. This is uh, from the book, The Seven Epistles of Christ, page 198. The era of brotherly love came as a result of a great revival in Protestantism. The period covers the latter part of the 18th and the first half of the 19th centuries. The Philadelphian era was marked by three things. A closer adherence to the written word and more fraternity among Christians and missionary zeal. We should have those three things. We should know the Bible. It should be a part of who and what we are. We should be loving. And it's called brotherly love, right? And that will sort of motivate us in mission. We aren't prejudiced about who we're talking to. It's about, well, here's a lost soul. God loves them. He's called me to work with them and to do that. Now, I put up here the word contrarian. Uh, it's, the root word is contrary. Well, the Bible Protestant, according to the world, will be contrarian. Jesus says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the word. And it says they had a closer adherence to the word of God, the Philadelphians. 
So if you love the word of God, and when you're standing up for truth, you're saying, and the Bible says, and God said, people are going to hate you for that. Because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. So you will be here, <clears throat> or should God allow us to live, we will be here, protect it, while we're promoting the truths of God. That's uh, John chapter 17, verses 14 and 15. Now, important scripture. I'm sure you've read it before or probably know it by heart. Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Well, the word has power, does it? It does. So if I'm storing it in my mind so that it is my guide in my actions so that I don't sin, does that have power to transform me? It does, and, and this is sort of a, a supplement to that. This is Education, page 126, paragraph 4. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the Infinite One. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. What is Satan attempting to prevent? The knowledge of God, because he understands the knowledge of God, once incorporated, will change the nature of the human agent into the image of God. This next statement comes from Education, page 289. And remember I said this morning that the papacy um, is interested in developing in its people, its subjects, a certain mindset. Well, God is trying to do the same thing in his people. And this statement says, the will is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or choice. Every human being possessed of reason has power to choose the right. In every experience of life, God's word to us is, choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua 24:15. Everyone may place his will on the side of the will of God, may choose to obey him, and by thus linking himself with divine agencies, he may stand where nothing can force him to do evil. Now think about that. Some people make, this, they make moral decisions based on circumstances. You ever heard of something called situational ethics? Well, it kind of depends on, you know, if the situation is... Well, even if they want to kill my closest family member, should I yield to man? Well, what did Jesus say? He has power to give life. We discussed that this morning in the four doors. God can resurrect that person. But the aim of it, and Satan will always do this, attack your closest emotional ties to get you to yield your allegiance from God. Be careful of that. Now, this is one of my favorite paintings. It's called the four, let's say, the four preachers or the four apostles. Um, but what you see in the hands of these men are actually the gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of those stones has one of those four gospels, the names: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what you see there is the word of God being used to stone the papacy. Um, you'll see nuns and priests and there's a pope down there at the bottom, but the word of God crushes. That's why Rome hates the Bible, because the Bible exposes her master, which is the devil. But this is uh, a statement, I believe it's from the Great Controversy. It says, to the Romanist, the Bible is a forbidden book because it plainly reveals the errors of the Roman system. And whoever searches the Bible with an enlightened understanding cannot long be in harmony with Romanism. So if you know your Bibles, you'll know that that's not a system you want to join. You go, well, why is it that... People in Seventh-day Adventist and evangelical circles are joining with the papacy. It should be obvious. They've come away from the Word of God because we're supposed to keep our distance from that system in terms of joining in with it. It says, He who searches the Bible to understand the truth will find no authority in the Word of God for the assumption of power on the part of popes and cardinals. There is no word of God that sanctions their assumed superiority or supremacy over their people, as there is no word to sanction the claim that Lucifer made in heaven of superiority over Christ. 
The claim of the papacy to superiority is made under the influence of the first great usurper who so persistently urged his right to supremacy over the host of God. This is Signs of the Times, February 19, 1894, paragraph 3. Now, what are we to be motivated by? Because the first thing says they have an adherence to the word of God. Well, we need love, right? John 13, 34 to 35 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have one, sorry, if ye have love one to another. So, when you're being hit by somebody who's satanically inspired, to not retaliate is going to be a sign of something higher than men. It's a sign that God is controlling you. Because the natural human tendency is to hit back. Christ never did that and he had all power. So, he's our example. This is from Review and Herald, September 11, 1883, paragraph 10. Wherever there is union with Christ, there is love. Whatever other fruits we may bear, if love be missing, they profit nothing. Love to God and our neighbor is the very essence of religion. No one can love Christ and not love his children. Does that sound like the Ten Commandments to you? The first half, or actually the first four, is love to God, then love to man. So you cannot love Christ and not love his children. It says, when we are united to Christ, his mind is transferred to us. Purity and love shine forth in the character. Meekness and con truth control the life. The very expression of the countenance is changed. Christ abiding in the soul exerts a transforming power. And the outward aspect bears witness to the peace and joy that reign within. This next statement is from Review and Herald, um, February 10, 1891, paragraph 9. Through the plan of God, every soul who has an experimental knowledge of Christ is to be a co-laborer with him in the saving of other souls. You should ask yourself, what am I doing for the salvation of those for whom Christ died? Wherein am I a laborer together with God? And this is the area of missionary zeal. What am I doing? So, for the, for the Philadelphian, there is... Um, adherence to the Word of God, then uh, you also have what we're doing now, which is missionary zeal. What was the second one? Anybody remember? I'm just, I'm just trying to quiz you on that. But there's three aspects of it. Now it says, the ransom for your soul was paid on Calvary's cross. Such love Christ had for you. And now wherein do you manifest love for perishing souls? Do you love others as Christ has loved you? There are lost sheep to be brought to the fold. There are prodigals to be received with love and joy and brought back to the Father's house. Where are the unselfish, disinterested efforts put forth for the uplifting of the lost, for the healing of the erring, for the nourishing of the weak? Now, uh, we have a... Uh, Part of the missionary message that we have is the three angels' messages. I won't go through that scripture, but I will read this. Uh, Great Controversy, page 390. Revelation 18 points to the time when as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And the people of God still in Babylon will be called upon to separate from her communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and it will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then the, truth, the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call, come out of her, my people. Continuing in that same line of thought, Testimonies to Ministers, page 446. The same angel who visited Sodom is sounding the note of warning, Escape for thy life. 
The bottles of God's wrath cannot be poured out to destroy the wicked and their works until all the people of God have been judged, and the cases of the living as well as the dead are decided. And even after the saints are sealed with the seal of the living God, his elect will have trials how? Individually, not in a group. Personal afflictions will come, but the furnace is closely watched by an eye that will not suffer the gold to be consumed. The indelible mark of God is upon them. God can plead that his own name is written there. The Lord has shut them in. Their destination is inscribed, God, New Jerusalem. They are God's property, his possession. Now, I'm pretty sure you guys know who these guys are. Um, homeland Security. But this comes from Great Controversy, page 592, paragraph 1. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. So Romans 13 will be misapplied. We only owe allegiance so far as that allegiance does not interfere with our duty to God. Now this is a, an interesting little book. Um, it's called Huss the Heretic. Um, and it was written by somebody who was actually there um, at his burning, if you will. He was burned at the stake. He actually wasn't burned alive because he suffocated from the smoke. Then they burned him. But um, this is the, 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 the response of a soldier who watched John Huss die. Now, this could be us too. And when I'm saying the last Protestant, you may be the last Christ-like person somebody ever sees. And that could have an impact like on this soldier. He says, I fought many a battle in my day and I've seen many a brave man die at Raphael's, in the Glarner lands, at Bergen, Nidau, Unterfern, and in the lands of Appenzell. But my old eyes have never seen such courage and fearlessness in the face of certain death. Therefore, I think that this Bohemian, John Huss, is a just man, suffering in innocence. And I have no wish to serve masters who persecute the feeble and protect the lewd papists. Take back my spear and my sword, for I shall leave Constance today before the smoke rises to smother Huss and the fire's blaze, which will consume his bones. Now, do you think that watching the people of God suffer will not affect someone who's ready to receive the truth among the camps of the enemy? Sure will. Because God has people there too. Um, and our sort of commission is from Acts chapter 26 verses 16 to 18. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. I hope you take that to heart too, because that's our goal as Christians. Now, I'm going to say something to you that you might not have heard before, um, but I would, I would say that I uh, hope that you would pray about it as you hear me state it. But you guys all remember the image in Daniel chapter 2 and the way that that image was destroyed. Now, I'm applying that, and I know most people say, oh, it's the second or the third coming of Christ, and it's the, you know, building up the kingdom in the earth, and I don't disagree with that. But I think there's another aspect to it that we might want to consider. This scripture is from Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 20. God is speaking to Zion in these verses about Babylon. Now, apply it. Thou, meaning you, are my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Now, 
In Daniel, that image was broken by a stone cut out without hands. Now, we know that the rock is Jesus Christ, but we are His people. We are considered in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Mount Zion. Is it possible that God will use us as individuals to be part of that stone to crush these kingdoms? I'm just saying to consider it. Because when you read those verses, there's a direct application to Daniel 2, to what we saw there. Daniel sees this stone cut out without hands, and it destroys the image at the feet. Where are you and I in history? The image of iron and clay, right? Church and state being combined. Is it not possible that God could be referring to you, to me, in this verse? If you go back to Daniel 2, it's the same wording, if you will. This next statement comes from The Faith I Live by, page 309. Love for lost souls brought Christ to Calvary's cross. Love for souls will lead us to self-denial and sacrifice for the saving of that which is lost. And as Christ followers give back to the Lord His own, that's people, they are accumulating treasure which will be theirs when they hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew 25, 21. The joy of seeing souls eternally saved will be the reward of all who follow in the steps of the Redeemer. And because we do this work as individuals, there's a statement in the Bible from Zechariah 8.23. And I'm saying, could it be that you will be the last Protestant that someone ever sees? The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. And I said to you this morning that nobody will be in heaven without a starless crown. Somebody will be saved because of your individual witness. And even though, and I'm going back to 1 Kings 19.10 where Elijah is complaining about, they want to kill me, I'm the last one left. And I would urge you to remember the Reformer's Prayer. And this is where we'll end. This is from Great Controversy, page 156, paragraph 3. And this is Martin Luther when he's faced with the papacy way back when. He said, O Almighty and everlasting God, he pleaded, how terrible is this world. Behold, it openeth its mouth to swallow me up, and I have so little trust in thee. If it is only in the strength of this world that I must put my trust, all is over. My last hour has come. My condemnation has been pronounced. O oh God, do thou help me against all the wisdom of the world. Do this, thou alone, for this is not my work, but thine. I have nothing to do here, nothing to contend for with these great ones of the world. But the cause is thine, and it is a righteous and eternal cause. O oh Lord, help me. Faithful and unchangeable God, in no man do I place my trust. All that is of man is uncertain. All that cometh of man fails. Thou hast chosen me for this work. Stand at my side for the sake of thy well-beloved Jesus Christ, who is my defense, my shield, and my strong tower. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, for the things that we've heard today, thank you. Um, thank you for the strength to say them um, and the power to stand here. Uh, in Jesus' name, I pray that the things that have been heard will take root in our minds um, to promote us in the ways of God, um, to seek you early and to find you, um, to also um, examine our lives so that we see where do we stand with you. Um, and I ask you for the power of the Holy Spirit to give us willing hearts, willing minds um, to follow after Christ. As we leave here, please grant that your angels will shield us from Satan. Um, and I pray that ultimately we will all be saved. But help us to choose the side of right by your power. In Jesus' name, amen.